welcome back Janie Morris here reading you uh, the chapters from my book Against Their Odds the book that I wrote in 2014 after having been given the life-threatening diagnosis in um, May 2012 of potentially only having two months to live this year 2022 is the 10th anniversary of that prognosis of only being given two months to live I wrote the book uh, partly to be a creation of inspiration for others and also to highlight the background that occurred for me uh, leading up to that day in May 2012 uh, just in case it inspires or acts as a bit of a wake-up call for others experiencing those type of things in their life and uh, and stopping preventing what happened to me anyway this is chapter four so sit back and relax and let me share chapter four with you cancer and other illnesses it was the lifestyle I was living that triggered my problems and it was the surprise confession of a very successful businesswoman and friend a few years later that jolted me into a world of reality cured me so to speak of my personal inner challenges and got me focused on living a more authentic existence. My problems were her problems, however, she acknowledged them sooner than I did. In fact, it took her bravery to give me the courage to eventually make some drastic changes by the way I was living. It was during a casual discussion with my friend about her successful life that rocked me, made me seriously consider the way I was living. However, it wasn't until a, a while later that our conversation really hit home. The gentle words she spoke to me as we enjoyed what might have been the last gorgeous sunny weekend on the beach made quite an impression on me. It was our long overdue catch up. I first met my gorgeous young girlfriend several years previously through an introduction to redecorate my home on the beach. We had instantly struck a fondness for each other as she was like the daughter I never had. And whilst her talent in school was obvious, I still seemed to feel a certain protectiveness towards her. Her vulnerability and innocence on one level opened up to me and we formed what was and still is a long relationship. As we strolled along, she started to share what was on her mind. I've achieved what I set out to do seven years ago, Janie. I wanted to create, create my own business that filled the niche in the market that was so obvious to me, however, not to others. It's been very successful. We're in demand and I've won many amazing awards. However, I'm done. I've lost the drive and motivation. That's what I loved. Now it's the operational side of the business and I'm working my butt off nearly seven days a week and all the money is going back to pay my staff, my overheads and everything else and there's nothing left for me. I told her I knew how she felt because unfortunately I had been there many, myself many times. I remember saying to her, even when I've worked for others in the senior corporate positions, I've also had the responsibilities of all of the operational side of the business and it can be overwhelming. You can easily lose your own purpose inside it all. The memories flooded back as I spoke these words to her. How many times had I been placed in a position to drive a company to success or steer salespeople to the top and during the process got lost myself and then to leave and have nothing to truly show for it? She had continued to explain how she had sat with the other finalists and winners of a recent award series she had been a part of and heard stories from these amazing people who had all created their own success in business and about the cancer and other illnesses in their families, divorces, broken family relationships and even financial challenges that are causing concern even now. I can't help but think what it's all for, she asked. Her questioning and assessing of this moment in time was something that I had been hearing all too often from many people, and increasingly so. I returned to that conversation later when I was forced to reconsider my own life and my own lifestyle. After the chat on the beach, I checked my phone for messages when I returned to the car. The warmth of the midday autumn sun was tempting me to stay there all afternoon, as I knew that moments like these were going to be all too few in the coming weeks. As I soaked up the vitamin D hit, I reflected on our talk 
and realize the same type of conversation is being shared with people every day and it's causing stress, both silent and obvious on every level. It dawned on me how this talk was triggered by such a young woman. Her realization about work-life balance was usually the observation of much older individuals. To me, it was a clear sign that the physical, emotional and financial challenges that people were having every day were getting worse and the end result, if not identified and dealt with soon, would be the silent awakener. As I drove away, I, look, I took in the last of the ocean smells and watched the seagulls flying off and made a conscious decision to stop the procrastination that had plagued me for so long and tell my story. I'm going to go on today and read chapter five. Chapter five, don't worry, be happy. Five years after the father of my children passed away, my mum became ill with bowel cancer and while she beat it, a subsequent fall several years later started her overall decline and she was just a few weeks short of her 84th birthday when she passed away. I have been a trained healthcare professional and have moved on from that career to develop my own marketing and promotions company. However, when mum became ill for the second time after her fall, I reduced the opportunities for work to allow me more time to focus on her and family. For me, it was the right thing to do. My mum was my very best friend. I trusted her with the life she gave me and she was the person I turned to when life became tough. She was my mentor and it was heartbreaking to watch her suffer the way she did. First at home, then in hospital, then in the nursing home. And as a trained nurse, I recognized the signs before mum did. While she'd been diagnosed as suffering from bowel cancer initially several years prior, she eventually passed away because of heart failure and emphysema. For a time, it was like I was living life in reverse. Mum had been there for me when I needed her most when I was a kid when I was growing up and now I was there for her when she needed me most, when she was dying. As a nurse, I knew that medical science could cure death temporarily. However, it really only puts off the inevitable. And as a nurse and a daughter, I had to help get mum ready to leave this mortal coil. I had helped turn her room in the Glenelg Community Hospital into a home. However, she was in a lot of pain and had been in agony in the last days. And when the doctors discussed morphine injections to ease her suffering, I had to make that decision on my own. It was very, very hard, very distressing, and it crushed me. Looking into her eyes as the decision was made, will be a sight I will never forget. The reality of the pending goodbye was now upon us both. As life slipped away from my mother's gorgeous body, the anguish in the room seemed incredibly distant. The memories of the previous weeks and the many nights, just the two of us in her hospital room, came flooding back. Our chats of the adventures we had shared throughout our 49 years together, her thoughts on how I should deal with my siblings when she was gone, her dreams for her much loved grandsons, my two boys, and the time she had shared. We discussed the signs she would give me when she was gone to let me know that she was there and we talked about how she wanted to have her final farewell celebration. She peppered many a conversation with the reminders she had given me on my own life, including how alcohol affected my system and reminded me that she wouldn't physically be at the end of the phone if I tripped up. So I was to really focus on not allowing that to affect my life. She backed those conversations up with how proud she always was of me and how confident, self-assured and great she believed I was. You are definitely your mother's daughter, was her constant endorsement. It didn't seem long that everyone had left. I'd made the calls from the hospital to the funeral home and, doc and doctor and then went back to kiss her goodbye. As I returned to my home, only a short distance away on the beach, her favorite place to be. I realized I needed to go back. Mum was all alone in that room, awaiting 
her next journey. How could I have left her? As I walked into the room, she looked beautiful and somewhat serene. I closed the door, sat down beside her and held her hand in mine. As the tears streamed down my face, while we wait, awaited the funeral home transport, I kept searching her face. Wishing she would open her eyes. And give that amazing smile and say it was all a dream. I spoke to her as if she was there. Somehow I knew that she heard me. I asked her for strength as I knew the coming week would be the hardest in my life. And I asked her for strength to carry on. I now truly felt alone. And all of the times throughout my life when I thought I had been alone before, just disappeared. For I was never alone then, not really alone. This moment right now was what being alone was all about. When you lose your mother to the next world and you briefly struggle to find a way to stay connected, time easily showed me the connection is real as long as we allow it. Standing in the bright sunlight on the side of the road, watching the black, the back of the shiny white van drive away, I called out to her that she would be okay. It's okay, Mum. I'm not far away. I'll see you soon. I couldn't know how true that almost was. I returned to my house on the beach and I was numb. I can't remember the deep and heart-wrenching crying that took place, although my dear caretaker mentioned to me weeks later that he heard it from downstairs and wanted desperately to console me. However, he knew I needed to release it all. I went down to the beach and walked into the water up to my shoulders. The ocean was totally still, like glass. And as I stood there for what seemed like an eternity, I watched the sunset on the day I discovered true aloneness. At home I was deadened, anaesthetized, and I was hurting too for my boys. They were hit hard emotionally because my mother was more than their nan. She was their mum too for most of their lives. However, we worked together through the following week the best we could with strength, courage, and amazing ability to keep it together in preparation for the final farewell. As I entered the church for the funeral service, I did so with a kind of forced smile on my lips and a tear in my eye. For so long, I had been trying to be every woman in the world, mum, sister, daughter, wife, partner, friend, and I was seriously struggling to hold everything together. I couldn't immediately see my sons in the church because the sight of the gorgeous flowers adorning my mother's coffin were all I could see. My youngest son, however, quickly found me and we walked to the front of the church and took our place. I was shaking terribly and struggling for strength. However, I was ready for what was about to happen. The church filled rapidly, although I was oblivious to most people there. I did, however, notice that all of my family sat on the other side of the church, numb by me, which only reinforced what mum and I had discussed would happen. Nonetheless, so many of my dear friends came, some I hadn't seen for quite some time. Finally, just before the service began, my eldest son and his dog, Major, my mother's favourite animal in the world, entered the church and they sat on the other side of me. So there was one son on my left and one on my right. Major clearly sensed the situation as he sat down in front of us and kept looking up as if to say he was there and he would take care of us. As I approached the podium to share the eulogy that had been fashioned from a combination of what mum had asked for, and what her sister, my Aunt Jane, had assisted on, I became starstruck. Me? The person who had thus far spent most of her life on stage and in the public eye. The person who was never short of a word or two and could spontaneously address hundreds of strangers on various topics and issues? Yes, me. And I feared I would let mum down. Once I started, however, I made sure not to look at anyone. I knew if I looked at my sons, I would cry because their pain was spearing my heart. I knew if I looked at my brother, I would feel anger and that would change my tone and mum didn't deserve that. 
so I spoke reading the words that had been written and practiced so as not to falter, and yet there they were, the words that I knew would break me. As I choked back the tears, I took a deep breath and then finished. It was done. A final goodbye in this life. As my sons and I spent time together that evening, some of the signs mum and I had discussed started to appear. She was with us. It was a pretty horrendous time, the worst in my life. However, it got worse. The following month, while I was trying to sort out mum's estate and every other thing that needed to be tied up, I had a massive blow up with my brother at my mother's home. My pain seemed unending, relentless. I felt I was repeatedly getting beaten over the head. It was in that moment that I made the conscious decision to divorce my brother and elder sister. And whilst I loved my other sister, Wendy, I unfortunately needed to include her as well. I suppose some people might say that in a way those relationships were what you would call fate. I didn't want the divorce to happen, however it did. I couldn't figure it out. Someone might rationalise the issue as just bad luck or destiny and that there is nothing you can do about some things. Nonetheless, I found it was very difficult to just stand by and forget that a game was being played with and against me. One of the signs mum talked about in our last conversations was a wind chime I had bought for her many, many years ago. It was made of silver metal and she always had it tingling on her tree out the back so you could hear it jingling when you were inside. She said that when the chime sounded, that would be one of her signs, that when I heard it tinkling, she would be there. So after she passed away, I untied it from her tree, took it home and hung it in the front door. However, where we live, the wind just can't catch it near the door because we are blocked off by big fences, yet every now and again, the chimes do move and tinkle. I believe it is mum just letting me know she is still with me. The other sign was her song and her favourite saying, don't worry, be happy. I had heard that forever because whenever I got a lecture from her at the end of it, she would turn away and say, in a Scottish accent, don't worry, be happy. They were the two signs we talked about and you know ever since then, whenever I've heard that song on the radio, it's usually been in a situation where I've needed help. Another strange thing, another sign maybe, is that her favourite singer of all time was Australian singer Guy Sebastian. There were others, of course, Tom Jones and Engelbert Humperdinck, and two years after she passed away, Guy Sebastian released a song titled, Would You Believe? Don't Worry, Be Happy. Then one day I got in the car, I'd been incredibly depressed for days, thinking about my mum and having struggles within my own relationship. And there was the song on the car radio. It was the first time I'd heard it. Again, it was a sign. Yes, indeed. The days, they pick you up and they put you down. And that, my friends, was chapters oh, three and four. Emotional. Rereading what I wrote back in 2014 when my book was published. So much has happened since then. So many things have changed within this book. The new edition of the book will be coming out soon. There are things that are being taken out of this current issue of the book uh, because for those of you who do follow me, you do know that um, last year uh, I did go through a fairly, uh, a fairly bad marriage breakup. And uh, so there are things that are being changed in the book to reflect a bit more of the reality of the situation in 2012, uh, shall we say, in hindsight. Um, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed the reading of this uh, in celebration leading up to my 10th anniversary of being given two months to live. Against the Rods is the name of the book. Uh, you can get the whole book in full audiobook version. It is available at Amazon, certainly available from uh, the sheroesunlimited.com website in the shop as well, as well as the in, in ebook version if you like reading ebooks uh, and I do have limited copies of the hardcover the original hardcover personally signed if you would like one of those please contact me direct you can con contact me at info at janiemorris.com and uh, I'd be more than delighted to send you a personally signed copy of uh, of the book there's only we only have 
about 100 left so if you'd like that please let me know as well anyway i hope you enjoyed that and i look forward to your company on the next reading of uh, chapter five of against their odds i'm janie morris thanks for your company